Good afternoon. My name is Adrian Dix. I'm BC Minister of Health. To my right is Dr. Bonnie Henry, BC's Provincial Health Officer. I just wanted to say last night that 13,000 people tuned in to the virtual town hall in the Vancouver Island Health Region, uh, co hosted by uh, Mitzi Dean, MLA, and Sonia Furstenow, MLA, with uh, CEO Kathy McNeil and uh, uh, Medical Health Officer Dr. Richard Stamwick, who received and answered many questions from the public that tonight uh, there will be a virtual town hall in Northern Health hosted by MLA's Mike Burney and Doug Donaldson and with Kathy Ulrich, the CEO of Northern Health, and Marina Fumerton, the Medical Officer of Health, Medical Health Officer, I should say, in Northern Health. And that tomorrow, uh, April 23rd, in Interior Health, Kathy, Katrina Conroy, I should say, and Norm Letnick, uh, MLA's will be hosting uh, a town hall with Dr. Sue Pollock, uh, the MHO for Interior Health, and Susan Brown, the CEO of Interior Health. Um, we're honored, uh, as I say, to be here on the territory of the Lekwungen speaking people, the Songhees and the Esquimalt First Nation. And I'm honored to introduce Dr. Bonnie Henry for today's COVID 19 update. Thank you, and uh, thank you for um, welcome to today's update. Uh, for April 22nd, uh, we have 71 new cases who have tested positive today, bringing our total of uh, test positive cases in British Columbia to 1,795. That includes 745 people in the Vancouver Coastal Health Region, 747 in the Fraser Health Region, 110 people in the Vancouver Island Health Authority, 153 in the Interior Health Region, and 40 in Northern Health Region. We have uh, a number of outbreaks, as you are aware. Uh, we have three new outbreaks in long-term care facilities that were announced earlier today by Fraser Health, all of them in the Fraser Health area. And as we know, we have been putting a lot of attention at detecting um, any uh, cases in our long-term care sector very early, and that's a reflection of the numbers that we're dealing with. We have 20. Um, uh, ongoing outbreaks in addition in long-term care assisted living and, and one which is in an acute care unit. Um, in addition, four of the long-term care facility outbreaks uh, that were uh, active in uh, Fraser Health have been declared over. Uh, in our other outbreaks, we have 77 cases associated with the Mission Federal Correctional Facility and the ongoing investigation and support to that facility with Fraser Health, um, including the infection prevention and control and outbreak investigation continues. There are uh, five inmates who are in hospital currently. In addition, we have the 28 cases we uh, talked about yesterday that are reflected uh, the outbreak that's ongoing and the investigation that's ongoing into the poultry processing plant in Vancouver Coastal. In terms of our case status, 103 people are currently hospitalized and of those we have 46 people who are currently in critical care or ICU in BC. We have an additional three deaths to report today, bringing our total of people who have died from COVID-19 in British Columbia to 90. Um, they are all people in the long-term care homes and our hearts go out to the families and the caregivers. We now have 1,079 people who are fully recovered from COVID-19. As we talked about yesterday, we continue to experience new community outbreaks in British Columbia. And this, of course, is very, very concerning to me and to all of us. This tells us that we have more work to do to break the chains of transmission in our communities and to make sure that every individual, every business, every community, every family does what we need to do to break these chains. And that's everyone all the time. We can't afford to have any weaknesses in our firewall if we are going to be able to, to move ahead into our new normal. We know people are tired of staying apart from their loved ones. We know we are tired from, of not being able to do the social connections and events that we are used to doing. 
but to ease restrictions, we need to have a decline in both the number of new cases and the numbers of outbreaks. And as I've said many times, there are things that we can control and there's things that we don't have control over. What is happening around us, both in the United States and in other provinces in Canada and internationally, affects us. And we know that that is one of the reasons why we have to be so vigilant here in British Columbia. Until we clear this hurdle, we can't begin to make changes. One of the most important things that we all need to do is to stay home if we're not feeling well, and, to, and with no exception right now. We know that many people experience very mild symptoms with this virus, and some may think it's just the sniffles or, or perhaps even just allergies at this time of year. It makes it really hard to tell if you have COVID-19, but you can still transmit it to others, even with very mild symptoms. So let me be 100% clear. Right now, if you are ill, whether you feel it's a cold, whether you feel it's allergies, whether you are concerned you might have COVID-19, stay home, stay away from others, and immediately contact us, and we can help you get tested if that's appropriate. We also expect that employers need to pay attention to this and need to be responsible. You must have measures in place to ensure everyone who's working is healthy and can keep a safe distance from each other in the workplace. We do not penalize employees for staying home if they are ill during this pandemic. We also, employers need to understand that an outbreak in your business has effects on all of us. It also can have significant financial impact both for the business and for your employees. As we've seen with the number of businesses recently, an immediate shutdown is required so that we can ensure that we're not passing this on in those situations. Your own business will only be able to open again once we are confident that it can operate without putting people in danger, the employees or the community. So as we are planning for what we want to do in the near future, in our new normal, these sectors and businesses need to think about these. We need to address these issues before we can reopen safely. We need to have measures in place to keep people safe, to avoid further outbreaks. If we start having these types of outbreaks and spread in our community, we can overwhelm our system and that's what we've been working so hard to avoid for the last few months. So we need to have enhanced cleaning, both personal hand hygiene, as well as in our environment in the workplace. Being able to keep, keep a safe physical distance and supporting employees and others to stay away if they are ill. We need to have a plan for every business that is open in, in the event that an outbreak should occur so that we can detect them early, we can remove people from the workplace, we can connect with public health and ensure that we are um, isolating people appropriately so they aren't going to be transmitting it to others. There's an order providing this guidance for industrial camps and we and for and we uh, given guidance for those businesses, those essential businesses that have been open, we need everybody to follow these. And we need the same from other businesses as we look to opening things up in the coming weeks. We need to keep our firewall strong. And we have to be 100% committed to all of us doing our way, doing our bit to see our way through this storm. I want to take a minute before I finish today um, to just say a word to, uh, we're aware, I think many of us are more aware today about the, the details of the senseless tragedy that has folded in Nova Scotia, a place that's very dear to me, in this time of unparalleled challenge. And I just want to say to my Nova Scotia family, wherever you are, and to my RCMP family, know that, know that I'm heaving a sigh and a wish for thee and will mourn with you from afar. So all of us need to do our part, and we need to continue to support each other in doing that. We need to be calm and to be kind to each other and to be safe. Thank you very much, Dr. Henry. I know that everyone uh, in British Columbia um, agrees and uh, 
has the same feeling for people, the people of Nova Scotia today and what they're going through and the, the grief, the collective grief that people are going through in Nova Scotia. I also wanted to start by uh, acknowledging the families of the three people who passed away from COVID-19 in the last 24 hours in BC, two are in Fraser Health, one in Vancouver Coastal Health, all were in long-term care. But all, all those families are going through uh, grief right now and not just the grief of, uh, of a loved one passing away but the grief of the circumstances we're in when people are all often separated from the ones they love in uh, these very important moments in, in, in families and in communities. So our condolences and our thoughts go out to all of them. Uh, as Dr. Henry has said, today is a day in terms of the numbers, which sometimes uh, people uh, will often people will analyze after um, the, these um, press briefings that we have 71 more cases today, reflecting uh, the situation in Vancouver at United Poultry in part and others and as well uh, the numbers in terms of acute care where we have 103 cases, which is I believe the lowest number we've had in the month of April, down from a high of 149 and in critical care, 46, which is also the lowest amount we've had in, in April, show the, the continuing effort made by the community, I think, to um, break uh, the links of transmission of COVID-19 and something that we have to continue to commit to. In acute care hospitals today, uh, there's about a 62.1% uh, occupancy rate, 4,222 vacant beds. As a report, 46% of critical care beds are um, currently occupied and uh, uh, there has been some interest in what's happening in emergency rooms, whether people are seeking the care they need. Again, uh, today more than four, uh, yesterday more than 4,000 people uh, visited emergency rooms across BC, which is up from uh, just under 3,000 on April 6th, although continuing to be down from the normal, uh, say March 9th when it was uh, approximately 6,500 visits. So that tells you that people are from where we were in April 6th, returning and using healthcare services when they need to use them and I think that's an important thing and something that we will continue to encourage. Uh, often we celebrate people who are working and uh, essential workers. I, I wanted to acknowledge that uh, April's Constructions and Skills Trades Month, that there's frequently events recognizing people in construction, people uh, uh, skills trades people across across British Columbia and obviously um, there isn't uh, the public recognition and the public celebrations that often accompany this but we know that thousands of construction workers are working on roads and hospitals and other critical infrastructure needed to keep water and electricity flowing that uh, that construction sites and work uh, sector and work sites have made significant adjustments to the way they operate and we wanted to acknowledge them all their all their contributions both to BC society and to um, and to uh, our communities in every part of BC also wanted to offer um, for the people who live with dementia uh, or who are supporting a loved one living de with dementia people know about the first link de first link dementia helpline that is available as a resource this is run by the Alzheimer's Society of BC Helpline staff and volunteers can provide support and information, very important in these times, about resources in the community. So, and uh, that number is 1-800-936-6033. And just to let people know that, that um, the Alzheimer's Society has extended First Link Dementia Helpline hours that, uh, uh, that uh, in English, um, uh, those no that number again is 1-800-936-6033. It's now Monday to Friday, 9 a.m. to 8 p.m. In Cantonese and Mandarin, it's 1-833-674-5007. And that's, uh, that is Monday to Friday, 9 a.m. to 4 p.m. And in Punjabi, 1-833-674-5003. And that's Monday to Friday from 9 a.m. to 4 p.m. And I wanted to... Uh, acknowledge the extraordinary ongoing work in this difficult time of the Alzheimer's Society which I think everyone in British Columbia who's ever been associated with the Alzheimer's Society knows that work and will appreciate that and in these times that work is even more important. There are a lot of questions, ongoing questions about surgery and the resumption of surgery. I just want to note that from the period March 16th to April 19th the total number of postponed case, surgical cases in BC was 13,988 
the total completed cases, because we, of course, have continued with urgent scheduled and unscheduled surgeries, is 11,936. So even though there was a uh, there that we have deferred and canceled um, uh, what are called sometimes called non-urgent scheduled surgeries, but essentially just scheduled surgeries that are all important, as we know, uh, there continues to be a lot of uh, activity in terms of surgeries in BC and extraordinary work continuing to be done. We've never had this period in uh, surgeries, it should be said, this need to renew uh, on the scope and to uh, go back potentially to having surgeries again in BC, to resuming elective surgeries, which we hope to do, of course, at some point. And I just want you to know as we proceed with this work, our commitment to patients has not wavered, that you are not forgotten that you are at the center of what we're doing, that we have been planning a resumption of surgery, which we are continuing to work on ever since um, the elective surgeries were canceled. That work continues, and I want everybody to know who's waiting for surgery that they are in our hearts and in our thoughts, and most importantly, in the work that's being done across health authorities in BC. And finally, I think we see the case, um, whether it's Cargill in Alberta, whether it's United Poultry here in Vancouver, whether it's the circumstances at the Mission Federal Institution in Mission, um, the significant and ongoing um, risks posed by COVID-19 to the health of people in British Columbia. And what it says to us, surely, is that we have to continue to do what we need to do, to be 100 percent all in. This is particularly important in light of these outbreaks. On the question of working sick, and just so everyone understands, there will be, and we are working hard on ideas of how we can move British Columbia forward from this point. But what is not going to change, what cannot change, and which has to happen now, is people have to stay home when they're sick. And this is going to be part of the new reality during this period of pandemic. Sometimes I think there's a sense that it's the brave thing to do or the courageous thing to do to play hurt or to work sick. Well, that can no longer be the case, and that is the responsibility of both employers and employees. That's something we have to continue to work on, but we have to especially have that happen now. Since we've been giving these briefings in January, that has been a consistent theme. Washing hands, not touching your face, but most importantly, staying home with your, when you're sick. It's the key part, it may be the most important part of being 100 percent all in. And we really need, in light of today's numbers and in light of these community outbreaks, we really need people to be 100 percent all in right now. En français, nous annonçons aujourd'hui 71 nouveaux cas pour un total de 1795 cas de COVID-19 en Colombie-Britannique. Nous sommes attristés d'annoncer trois nouveaux décès liés au COVID-19 dans la Régie de santé de Vancouver Coastal et Fraser pour un total de 90 décès en Colombie-Britannique. Nous offrons nos condoléances à tous ceux qui ont perdu leurs proches. Chaque Régie de santé, bien entendu, de la Colombie-Britannique compte des patients atteints de COVID-19. Uh, 745 se trouvent à Vancouver Coastal, uh, 747 à Fraser, 110 sur l'île de Vancouver, 153 dans l'intérieur et 40 au nord. Pour, parmi l'ensemble des cas confirmés, confirmés de COVID-19, 103 personnes sont actuellement hospitalisées, dont 47 en soins intensifs. Les autres personnes dont le test de dépistage a été positif sont en isolement à leur domicile. And just finally, I'm, uh, the Premier announced today the opening uh, on April 27th of uh, the, uh, the Urgent and Primary Care Center in James Bay in Victoria, and it shows what we're continuing to do. We need to continue to expand our public health services across BC. If anything about the last uh, few months has to told us anything, it's how important public health care is to everyone, and we're going to continue to make these efforts. And as you saw earlier this week in Castlegar and Vernon and Abbotsford, those efforts have expanded to urgent and primary care centers. And today I was delighted to hear the Premier's announcement of the, of the opening in Victoria on April the 27th. And with that, we're happy to take your questions. Thank you. As a reminder to everybody on the phone, please press star 1 to enter the queue. Uh, please also unmute your phones. You are not audible until we call your name. First question is from Vaughn Palmer. Son, go ahead, Vaughn. Hello, Dr. Henry. Uh, the other day you mentioned this uh, study in California of antibodies which had suggested a 
more widespread infection rate than had been detected with conventional testing. Um, could you discuss a little more the obstacles here in British Columbia to going to antibody testing? I know you've expressed, said there's some reservations or we haven't found a reliable test yet, but I, could you discuss what those are? And um, you also the other day provided a good discussion of the significance of the reproduction rate, but you didn't say whether we know enough here in British Columbia to know what it might be here so could you address that as well, please? Sure. So let's start with the, the serology testing. And, and uh, I will note that there's been quite a lot of discussion in the uh, medical community about the uh, study that was done in, in California, um, particularly because it was done on a sample of people. And the sample of people was uh, recruited through uh, um, a social media site. So it was, um, in many people's opinion, likely to be a bit biased towards people who had concerns that they might have had infection. The other thing that has um, become really apparent is that the test that they were using is one that has not yet been sufficiently validated and there's a high, a relatively high false positive rate. So that's one of the concerns, uh, the critique. As we know, we're all trying to learn a lot from the science of what's going on around the world and that means that many papers are getting out into the public before they have what we call peer review. So some of the peer concerns about um, the paper from uh, from California are around uh, how they recruited people and the, the validity of the test, which speaks to one of the challenges that we have. We want to make sure we know how the test works before we use it to make some, uh, such types of, of studies. And we have a number of them planned, very similar to what they did in California. However, using um, uh, random samples of blood from uh, a different source, so from um, community blood samples that were taken for other reasons, and there's a, a way we can do that. So we have a research process set up to do that, to help us understand, like they were trying to do in California, how many people might actually have antibodies in the community. So the challenge uh, in California was when they came up with their estimates, um, part of what they looked at was uh, put it, plotting the, the number of people who had died in that county, Santa Clara County, with um, the estimates of how many people might have actually been affected, infected. And it was somewhere around 4 or 5%. So I will note, um, you know, that's not enough to have community immunity or herd immunity. But it was much higher than the number of people who had actually been tested when the first phase of the outbreak really went through that county. So part of the conclusions were from this study, which was done on a very small sample, they extrapolated that, oh, it's not really that bad. The death rate is only about 0.2, which is closer to what we would see with seasonal influenza. So it's unfortunate that that got picked up as one of the conclusions because I don't think that is supported by either by the test because it has a higher rate of false positive or by the information that uh, uh, came out of that study. So this is kind of long-winded again, sorry. Um, Anyway, uh, in terms of what we are doing here, we want to make sure that we have actually validated the test in the population that we know have been affected here in British Columbia so we can understand what is the false positive or the false negative rate from this test. With every test that we have, it's not 100% either way. And it depends on what's most important, whether you want to make sure you're catching everybody or you, if you want to make sure that you're only catching people who have the disease you're looking for, which of the which of the parameters you're more um, it, it are more important? And the ch we've seen this challenge around the world with the serology tests that people are using. And the the UK um, purchased 3.5 million of uh, this one type of test and found out that it had an unacceptably high false positive rate and false negative rate. So that leaves us all with a dilemma, um, which is to say that the BCCDC is working with the population and actually one of the good news stories perhaps is that we are using, uh, we are working with uh, the Lynn Valley Care Centre um, with the people who have survived infection there and there's a, a good proportion of them to ask them to participate in helping validate this test because we know there are people who have tested positive for this, uh, for this virus. So that work is ongoing. I'm hopeful that we'll have a, a valid test that we can use, as we've mentioned before, to have a 
bar broader understanding of how many people in our community have been infected, but also to be able to understand um, who has uh, antibodies after being affected. It also helps us look at um, some of the contact tracing and understanding of outbreaks in our communities as they happen. So we are weeks, maybe, sometime in the next week to 10 days, we should have a much better idea of which tests we can use for which pieces of this. And um, we are part, of course, of a, of a national um, consortium um, to look at how we can use seroprevalence to understand the, the pandemic across Canada. Um, in terms of our not, it, it's a challenging thing because it, it, we, it's one of those parameters, so it depends, as we've talked about before, of how infectious the virus is, how long you're infectious to others, and how much contact you have with others during your infectious period. And, and this is gets down to our why distancing is so important. If you don't have contact with somebody, you can't pass this on, and that helps reduce our, our not. So we were probably at two or three early on as we were um, having increased transmission in our community, and that's what we've seen in other places as well. In Wuhan, it probably, which meant that every person who was infected transmitted it to two or three other people. We are now down below one, but we can only say that looking back. So it, it's a helpful marker to get, so we can understand what are the, the things that tell us that we're having increased rates of transmission or decreased rates of transmission. So the modelers at uh, the BC CDC are working with us on that and actually at UBC and Simon Fraser and we're talking with our clinical colleagues, we're looking at how can we use things like hospitalization, numbers of people in ICU to help us um, uh, estimate how we're tra tracking um, with, the, uh, with our reproductive number over time. And we'll be presenting some more of that uh, in the coming days, uh, probably later next week. Next question is from Brishti Basu, Victoria Buzz. Hi, Dr. Henry. Thanks for taking my question. I was wondering, what exactly is the criteria to declare someone recovered from COVID-19 in BC? Can you tell us whether it differs by health region or whether it's changed recently? And also, are there people in BC who have tested or tested positive or shown symptoms of the virus after they were thought to have recovered? Uh, yeah, so we we have criteria, we have two different criteria for um, how we are uh, determining whether somebody's recovered. And it is the same across BC, but I will address one issue in a minute. So initially, around the world, we were using after um, symptoms have resolved and you had two negative tests. So the, the um, nucleic acid test, the NAT test that we were doing, um, at least 24 hours apart. And we are still using that criteria for people who are hospitalized because they have more severe disease or for people who are um, immune compromised because we know they can shed virus for longer periods of time. But we also have a, a, what we call a clinical criteria, recognizing as we did at one point where lab testing took some time. We've also recognized as we've learned around the world more about this virus that some people can actually shed the virus for periods of time, but it's not live virus, so they're not um, going to transmit it to others. And there is a couple of papers, including a, one uh, out of Germany that helped us look at that, and essentially they were not able to find live virus in after eight days uh, from symptom onset. Um, once people's symptoms had resolved. So this is for people who have a mild illness, so which is a, a large proportion of the people in BC have tested positive. So if you have a mild illness, you're at home, your uh, fever has resolved, you're everything except sometimes people have a lingering cough that may go on for a period of time, and you're otherwise well, you're back to your normal activities, and it's 10 days since your onset of symptoms, then we consider people um, able to be out of isolation and recovered. So that's the criteria that we're using across the province. Um, there was a point when Vancouver Coastal was um, just using the algorithm for mild disease, and they, they didn't uh, have a, a physician over, oversee the, um, some of the reports. And it turned out that not everybody after 10 days had, who's, had their symptoms resolved. So we went back and recalculated that number um, in the daily follow-up with people. So it was um, 
it, it, so there was a bit of a reckoning uh, that happened last week to make sure that we weren't over including people and there were some people who have mild disease but their symptoms progressed and lasted longer than 10 days so we're still concerned that they might be able to transmit it to others so they aren't considered um, recovered until their symptoms resolve completely so that's that's kind of the complex criteria we use in terms of whether people have uh, we have had people who've um, early on, particularly with people with mild illness, we were testing them. To, uh, you know, they had to have two tests, two negative tests, and we found that people would be negative and then positive and then negative and then positive, and then sometimes it went on for some time. We now know that it's very unlikely that they will um, shed virus uh, that could infect others, and that's been shown again in, in uh, South Korea recently where they've had uh, upwards of 80 or 90 people who uh, after a period of time um, tested positive for the virus again but again not having symptoms and it's not clear that they are infectious well it does not appear that they're infectious to others so we're still learning a lot and it's uh, sometimes complex so we have to try and keep on top of all of the different combinations and permutations that happen Marcella Bernardo News 1130 Hello. Um, I wanted to ask again, just because I've been inundated with emails from people who are very concerned about this policy involving not letting staff work at more than one facility. I've been hearing from people in Kamloops. I've been hearing from people in the Tri-Cities area, um, pretty much all over the province, that they're worried that people are still working in facilities that they could be carrying this virus to other places like long-term care homes where their loved ones are. Yeah, so as we've said, it's quite complex. There are some people who are not part of this. So for example, we know doctors go between facilities. Um, they may have patients in different areas. We know that um, there are pharmacists who are in facilities. So there's a group of people who are excluded from that. They are not however, excluded from the need to use appropriate personal protective equipment and to minimize their visits and take all of the precautions that we need them to take. And there is a small percentage of people who need to work in both acute care, for example, and um, maybe one, one long-term care home. So there, there's not, it's not a blanket that everybody is at one. And so it may be some uh, people not recognizing who are the people who need to go um, between facilities, recognizing that uh, you know, they need to do it with all the precautions that we have put in place. Um, I will also say, and maybe I'll ask Minister Dix to address it, but it's taken some time to sort out all the combinations, again, of, of, uh, that affects so many people. And it's particularly um, a, a challenge to make sure that we have the appropriate nursing staff and um, uh, care aides that are able to uh, care for people in each facility. Yeah, yeah I, I mean, this... Uh principle came out very early on, I think, in, uh, after the outbreak at Lynn Valley and certainly applied very early on at facilities which were affected by outbreak. Uh, subsequent to that, there has been a, uh, a policy direction and then a provincial health order. And so it first, because Vancouver Coastal Health was affected first, uh, it was, uh, it proceeded ahead of Fraser Health. So you'll see uh, a lot, I think, very significant uh, progress in Vancouver Coastal Health. Island Health had fewer uh, numbers of people working in multiple care homes, as is the case with Interior Health, although they had some. Island Health completed its uh, work, I think, earlier. And Fraser Health, um, uh, which has thousands of people in the circumstances, has been ongoing and doing that work. So it is happening. It's a provincial health order. It's a direction, and that is going to be the direction uh, from now on. Uh, it involves thousands of people, so uh, I think the task will be completed soon. But the order is in place, and that's the direction that we've headed in and that, that we're on and is absolutely necessary in these times. And, of course, the consequence of that is we have to make sure the consequence of that is that care homes uh, have adequate staff to take care of people in care. In, in general, there's 29,000 people in publicly funded care and more, obviously, uh, who are in a strictly private uh, system or have uh, involved in private care home in some ways. In those 29,000 beds, there are some health authority owned and operated ones, there are nonprofit ones, there are for-profit ones, but they're all, 
all 29,000 of those beds are public beds. And uh, ultimately, uh, be due to availability, people have some choice. They make those decisions. So we have to ensure that standards are high across the piece, and that's what's happening now. It's been an extraordinary effort, but I think it reflects uh, the extraordinary impact on long-term care of COVID-19 and the necessity to make these changes. So it is happening, uh, Marcella. Um, there may be some people who haven't had it finalized yet, but uh, I think it's been an extraordinary effort to, to date, and it's our expectation that it'll be completed soon. Cindy Harnett, Times Colonist. Hi, thanks for taking my question. Um, if we continue to flatten the curve into um, May, do you foresee any modifications on restrictions of visitors to senior care homes? Um, and hospitals. And just by way of a clarification or an update, what is the policy around uh, visitation of someone uh, dying of COVID-19 in hospital? And what is the policy uh, around a first outbreak in a long-term care home? Like were we to have one on Vancouver Island? Is it to remove um, the patient uh, to a designated area or leave them in place? Yeah, uh, so um, in, in terms of restriction of visitors, it, it, there are exceptions right now, um, particularly for people in long-term care, also in hospital, who are at end of life in particular. And yes, um, those exceptions we expect to, to continue. I uh, absolutely hope to be able to at least have one family visitor um, be available, be able to go into long-term care to spend time only with their family member. Uh, the, there still will be restrictions in place in that they'll have to only go to their family member. We, I don't see us being able to open up care homes like we had where there's group events and, and families and others come in to, to be with uh, people in those our seniors and elders, but I do hope we'll be able to open it up to at least have one family member be able to, to come and spend time. I know how difficult it is, uh, not only for the families who are watching, but for um, for our seniors and elders in long-term care, particularly people with dementia and other medical conditions, and the same in hospital. It has been a very much a challenge uh, for people who are dying of COVID-19. Um, because of the, the infection prevention and control risk. And so um, I know in, in intensive care units in hospital, um, they are going to extraordinary lengths to make sure family can be as close as possible, um, recognizing that we have to wear personal protective equipment and make sure that, uh, that the staff are, are protected as well. Um, there is no, uh, you know, with an outbreak, it depends. Um, it depends on the resident, it depends on what room they're in and how well they can be isolated. Sometimes they're transferred to hospital, but it's not automatic. It depends on the family's wishes, the resident's wishes, um, and how well somebody is able to be cared for and isolated within the facility. Next question is from David Moko, CTV. <coughs> Hey, Dr. Henry. Um, I just wondered if you could go into a little bit more detail about what we're, lear what we're learning about uh, the outbreak at United Poultry. You know, we heard from the Premier earlier talking about how, how workers were going there sick. Can you give us a sense of how the contact tracing is leading, um, what you're learning about what was in place at the facility or what wasn't, so that message once again can be driven home to, to people watching this? Yeah, so, you know, this uh, meat p processing plant, as all of them are, are part of the essential services we need um, in terms of our food chain. Um, my understanding from Vancouver Coastal Health, who is doing the in de detailed investigation, obviously I get reports from them on how it's working. Um, so they had a report of a community pers a person in the community who had been tested for COVID-19. And in the, the um, course of our contact tracing and understanding the case investigation part of what we do with everybody, um, the person identified that uh, others in their workplace were ill. So an inspection was done at the workplace. Vancouver Coastal Health went there and realized that there were people who had respiratory symptoms who were in the workplace. 
And so uh, arrangements were made for them to be assessed, for everybody in the workplace to be assessed, and for an inspection to be done to understand you know, how close they were together, what protocols they had in place for things like hand washing, what protocols they had in place for people not coming into work if they were not feeling well, uh, whether there was oversight of those. And so uh, obviously a number of, uh, quite a few others of the uh, people who were on site at, the, at that time that Vancouver Coastal went on site, um, tested positive, and they are now all home. The, the factory has had to be closed down because of the, the amount of illness, but also to ensure that appropriate precautions and changes to the work flow could be done to safely protect the workers in that facility. So those are things that are ongoing. In addition, Vancouver Coastal is doing the investigation, and I should say in Vancouver and Fraser, a number of the people who worked in the facility actually live in, in the Fraser Health Region, and it is our convention of how we investigate these that uh, we, uh, we investigate it by uh, place of residence. So Van Fraser Health is working with Vancouver Coastal um, to ensure that every individual case, we find out who their contacts are. So if uh, who their family contacts are, who they may have had other close contact with. And those people are being isolated so that uh, if and when they develop symptoms, they will not be transmitting them to others. So it is ongoing. This has only been day three uh, since the outbreak was detected. So there's a lot of work being done right now um, across uh, the Lower Mainland to, to get a better handle of what's going on. Shristi Gangdev, CKNW. Uh, hi, Dr. Henry. We're just hearing about a case um, of someone who was apparently released from um, some sort of institution. I'm not exactly sure on the details. Uh, but was released from an institution and tested positive for COVID-19 and may have been on their way to a halfway house in Prince George, but then stopped uh, for a visit at a First Nation reserve. So there's concern about this. And I'm just wondering if you're aware of this, um, of this case and if you have any insight as to how that could have happened. Yeah, there's some um, ongoing challenges as we've talked about around, particularly around our outbreak at the Mission Correctional Facility. And we are aware that people, inmates, have come to the end of their time and have been released from that facility. I'm also aware that there's a number of issues uh, um, uh, in many regions uh, around Indigenous people and uh, going home to their communities, their home communities. Um, and uh, yes, we are monitoring this. I know that the First Nations Health Authority has been in touch around this specific issue, as well as uh, um, involved health authorities. And we know there's been a, a number of issues, uh, both in Fraser Health, um, in Vancouver Coastal, with uh, people um, being uh, coming there, as well as uh, Northern Health and uh, Vancouver Island. So it is, you know, it is a challenging thing because we know we have had um, we have had uh, people, cases and outbreaks, or I shouldn't say outbreaks, because it, in the community we've had transmission in communities in all regions of BC uh, that have affected Indigenous peoples and First Nations peoples, and so it is part of our ongoing challenge in managing, particularly when we get these outbreaks. And you know, the Mission Facility outbreak is uh, the second largest one that we are dealing with right now, and it is complex. It involves our, our federal partners, Correctional Services Canada. It involves a lot of work that Fraser Health has been doing to try and make sure we have the right infection prevention and control um, measures in place to protect the inmates and the people who work at the correctional facility and our community. And part of it is being notified when people are leaving the facility and making sure we can support them because as with every outbreak, with every close contact situation, we want uh, we want and will be supporting people to be able to self-isolate for that 14 days so that they're not in a position of transmitting it to anyone else. We have time for one more question this afternoon. For any reporters that didn't get to ask a question, there will be a statement released later 
today. Uh, for recommendations on protecting families and communities from COVID-19, visit bccdc.ca. For non-medical questions about the province's COVID-19 response, visit gov.bc.ca forward slash COVID-19. And for a full listing of the Provincial Health Officer's orders, visit gov.bc.ca forward slash PHO guidance. Last question is from Keith Baldry, Global News. Hi, uh, Dr. Henry. You've talked about the second wave of the pandemic in the past, and today uh, Robert Redfield, the uh, director of the U.S. Center for Disease Control, is saying that he fears the second wave is going to be lethal and far more serious than this wave because it's going to coincide with the start of the regular influenza season. I'm just wondering, what is Canadian public health's take on that second wave, and what impact is that going to have on any easing of restrictions? Yeah, and I've talked about it as well, and we look historically, um, and the, the construct that we've been looking at, and which he's referred to, um, Dr. Redfield's referring to, is what's happened with influenza pandemics, where we have a second wave um, in the respiratory season. We don't yet know, and I've talked about this as well, whether there is a seasonality to this coronavirus, but it is very concerning to me, and we've talked about this as well, that once we have influenza complicating things and the other respiratory viruses that we see, it's much more challenging to detect which one is influenza, which one is RSV, which one is parainfluenza, which one's COVID-19. And we know with COVID-19, it can go, be under the surface for quite some time. So that's why it is so important for us to do everything we can over the coming weeks. We've, we've managed to, to control this one fairly well right now, but we're starting to see community outbreaks and we need to get on those right away. And um, so important for us to try and get uh, this as down to zero as much as we can now. And that's where we've been emphasizing how important it is not to be around others if you're sick. Because come the fall, when we start to see other respiratory viruses again, it gets much more complicated for us. And that's when we're planning. We're planning as well for the, for the fall when we start to see respiratory virus season. We know that if influenza puts people in hospital every year. And we know that this is going to put people in hospital as well. So yes, there is very much a potential of a surge um, come the fall. And that's one of the things that we are working very hard to have in place, the surveillance that we need, the testing that we need, the contact tracing in our communities that we need. But we need to do everything we can now to try and, and stamp it out as much as possible so that we at least have a fighting chance when we're going into the fall. That's all the time we have today. Thank you. Thank you.